personal interactive software like STAR was unknown outside the research facilities in 1978, the year uh, Dandelion was started. Apple Macintosh began to catch up, perhaps, to STAR's capability about a decade later. Microsoft Windows took almost 15 years. Inside Xerox Park, however, we were quite used to this level of creature comfort. At SDD, a Xerox product group spiritually attached to Park, almost everybody had an Alto. First built here at Park in 1973, Altos furnished most of the computational horsepower for our culture. We had email and FTP all over the world via the ARPANET. Computer aided uh, impressive office automation and software development tools, and computer aided design facilities that took us from schematic to prototype nearly automatically. Our mission at SDD was to take some or all of this to the world, except we were going to redo it all from scratch. Alto was mature, and there were about a thousand machines in use in 1979. Basically, a 16 bit machine. Alto had a 600 by 800 pixel monochrome display arranged vertically like a sheet of paper, a 3 megabit Ethernet, a removable hard disk, and up to 512k bytes of RAM. Alto was implemented in small and medium scale TTL logic. The CPU was microcoded, and all micro instructions were completed in a 170 nanoseconds clock cycle. That's about 6 megahertz. Main memory cycles were about one microsecond, and by running 32 bits wide, that gives a total memory bandwidth of 32 million bits per second. In addition to emulating various instruction sets, microcode in the Alto was also used to implement much of each peripheral controller. The hard disk controller had, for example, only 16 -bit, a 16-bit word buffer. Since in those days, disk data rates were 1.5 million bits per second, microcode could leisurely read this buffer once every 10 microseconds, and small buffers meant low cost. STAR was to be much more powerful workstation. STAR's display was to be 1,024 by 800 pixels, some two pages compared to the Alto, and consume 51 megabits of memory bandwidth. Included too was a 10 megabit Ethernet, up from 3, and 10 megabit disk drive. In addition, STAR's application software with overlapping windows and multiple fonts and the pilot multitasking virtual memory operating system were both written in Mesa, and they were to be emulated by this same processor at the same time. Alto, in short, wasn't nearly fast enough. I had studied uh, our situation for my boss, uh, Bob Metcalf, one afternoon and was talking with him one afternoon in 1978. I was lamenting the problems we faced for STAR to build such a piece of hardware that would support such a thing. Bob's mind was wandering in the way it did when he'd already gotten the point. <laughs> but he looked at me and suddenly and said, so what are you going to do about it? Just sit here and whine? <laughs> SDD had no charter to do processor hardware. The last machine I'd personally designed was my homebrew 8080 in 1976, and I was at the very bottom of the SDD org chart. <laughs> my coworkers, Roy Ogus, Ron Crane, and Robert Garner, were working on the new 10 megabit Ethernet. Robert had heard tell that Butler Lampson had sketched out the design of a new kind of CPU on seven sheets of yellow paper. Butler's idea would make it possible to build a high-speed machine with relatively small IOTA controllers. Alto had been based on the 74181 accumulator chip, Butler's design, which was later called Wildflower, because they were expected to come up everywhere, used four 2901 4-bit CPU slices. He had a preliminary data sheet from National Semiconductor, which convinced him that the machine could be built with 100 nanosecond a cycle time and a 300 a nanosecond memory cycle. That would be a 10 megabit machine. Best of all, Wildflower's design could guarantee memory latency for I.O. controllers and get us the speed we wanted with Alto's simplicity and low cost. The genius, really, of Butler's design 
was the concept, in the concept was to synchronize the scheduling of micro instructions not only with the main memory, but also with peripheral controller microcode. Microprocessor tasks were scheduled in three instruction groups called clicks. And e each click, microcode had exactly three micro instructions and one memory access. Clicks were arranged into a round with each click, with each controller able to demand only a fixed number of clicks. In Dandelion's case, there were three clicks per round, five clicks per round. The disk controller had one click per round assigned. So the hardware for the controller could be designed knowing that one memory access was available every 15 clocks. Clicks not required by the controllers were given to the MESA interpreter. The scheme gave low-cost controllers, DMA, microcode-based virtual memory, and complete flexibility for the design of the of MESA's byte-coded instruction set. Another way of looking at Wildflower's architecture is that the CPU acts like the system bus in modern machines. One addition we made to Butler's design was the addition of an Intel 8085, which we kind of stuck in the side. And it was to manage all the low-speed I.O., such as keyboard, mouse, serial communication, floppy disk, and real-time clock. The 8085 also took care of the job of initializing the main CPU to put it into operation so that we didn't have a, have a huge amount of, of logic to support that function. So as a result, we ended up with an early dual processor system. Both uh, Bob Metcalf and Dave Liddell were ready to be behind us on this adventure, but they needed a document and lots of slides to support our claim that we were doing the right thing. And to reinforce what Dave's just been talking about, this is the environment, the same period of environment he's talking about, and the kind of, uh, as Dave was saying, no possible way of projecting this, uh, for, uh, interpreting this back from the current environment. Uh, in those days, things were very simple. Uh, microprocessor technology was not in the state that it is now by any stretch of the imagination. And the personal computer, as I say up there, was hardly such an animal. Clearly, our only choice to achieve STAR was a custom processor. Dandelion was an order of magnitude beyond anything currently available or envisioned for the near future. By the way, we picked the name Dandelion because Park had been picking project names after very aggressive beasts. Notice the aggressive beast hidden at the end of a common wildflower. <laughs> Dandelion's inception came at the end of the bipolar era. Motorola 68000 was introduced the next year in 1979 and signaled the end of bipolar machines. CMOS speeds and densities grew very quickly from then on. Dandelion shipped in 1981, the same year as the introduction of the IBM PC. The Apple Macintosh, the one that shipped in 1984, was also started that same year using the 68000 as a CPU. The team on Dandelion, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, actually put up a slide while Robert Garner is coming up to show the people that were involved in the very earliest part of that design. They were a very remarkable group. Our challenge was to have a picture on the screen by Christmas of 1979. This was accomplished by feeding the output of a scanner into memory. <laughs> Between 1978 and 1981, while the workstation was moved into production, the design was enhanced to support file servers and print servers. So here's a look at the people, and we'll get Bob Garner to come up and show some of these wonderful pieces of hardware here. Now, I think actually many of the people on this list are here. Uh, this feels a bit like a, a reunion. Uh, for me, it's been uh, going back and reawakening parts of my brain that I thought were gone a long time ago. Um, it's, it's been quite an experience. So thanks, Bob, for that introduction. Uh, I'm gonna do a little hardware show and tell. And I'm gonna try to set some context as well. You heard from Dave Liddell how this was an era of machines that are totally different from what we know today. And so I, 
I found some old slides in an old box and had them scanned in, and I'll show you up here to give you a little bit of a feeling for what the context was like. Um, now, one of the, I think it was uh, uh, Gordon Bell who, uh, who noticed, uh, who remarked many years ago that the, the design of a machine is based not only on its architecture, but also on the financial and the cultural aspects of the organization that builds it. And this was nowhere else true than, than here at Xerox. And at the time, well actually today, uh, a very powerful computer uh, fits in our pocket. Uh, you know, my 10-year-old understands that. But in the mid-1970s, uh, a computer of comparable performance, uh, you know, if you inadvertently bumped into this thing, you would smash your nose. So, you know, what today fits in your pocket looked like this in the mid-1970s. And these were the real computers. These were the ones that we were all supposed to aspire to and build, you know, coming out of school. Uh, not these little, little things you can put in your pocket today. So this was a much-loved machine, the PDP-10, a 36-bit machine a little under two MIPS in performance. What I like about all this is everyone now knows these terms. Uh, and about, uh, <laughs> about a mega word of memory, not a megawatt of power, but about a mega, <laughs> mega word of memory. <laughs> uh, a very much loved machine. The designers of the Star software would have loved to have had hardware of this power, but the technology wasn't quite there. Now a machine that was a little closer was the PDP-11. This is the Model 60. It was a 16-bit machine with a little more than half a MIP of performance and a quarter megabyte of main memory. And it turns out these, these features were almost precisely what the star designers were looking for in performance. Now, the only side effect is that it's not going to fit under your desk, obviously. So something had to be done. Uh, I noticed Dave referred to the, the two very uh, sexy I.O. devices on the side there. The, the terminal, the character terminal, and your own personal printer. So this is kind of what we wanted, but still it was a little too big. So what made the Star hardware unique? Bob talked a lot about this. Uh, really, it was based on the Alto. The, the designers here at, at Park on the Alto realized that really what they were designing was, in essence, an appliance. I called it an office appliance here. You know, these days we hear about you know, computers as appliances, but I think this is actually the first example because it did a very fixed function. A very simple fixed function, uh, not a real computer opened up to the user. So one of the first observations that the researchers at Park made was it didn't need a general purpose universal I.O. bus. Not necessary. And those universal I.O. buses were in the PDP-10, in the PDP-11. But you didn't need that in this system. In fact, if you wanted to expand functionality, you did it via the Ethernet. So this was kind of the breakthrough idea that, that uh, led us down this path. And so again, like Bob talked about, it, it allowed us to have very tiny I.O. hardware. In fact, most of the I.O. operations were done in software, in microcode. And uh, basically, it gave us state-of-the-art performance, just as good as that previous, those previous mini computers, but at a third of the power, weight, and cost. So the Star was actually a tremendous achievement for the time that, that all of us are very proud of. And Bob talked about this, and I'd like to show a picture of what it was all about. Butler Lampson, basically, and some of his cohorts here at Park came up with this idea of reworking the memory system so that the I.O. devices, uh, so that basically it was divided into five slots or rounds, kind of like a round robin, round robin hood's barn. And each time a device got hold of a slot, it could, it could move one memory word and it could execute three instructions. So this shows the five slots, uh, one for the disk, two for the ethernet, one for the display, and one for the slow I.O. And so this guaranteed that if a device needed to access memory, always knew it could get there within two microseconds. And once it got there, it would always get guaranteed bandwidth, one megabyte per second worth of bandwidth. So this was actually a correct by construction hardware design with respect to the I.O. As long as that box ran at the clock rate it had to run at, uh, the I.O. was going to work and not have one of the terrible side effects of many of those mini computers had at the time, which was when too much I.O. happened, they tended to drop data on the floor. So this was a very innovative design, correct by construction, which is a phrase I hate, but was actually true in the case of this machine. We knew it would work as long as it met the cycle time. So I'm gonna do a little show and tell. This is where we get a little physical here. Uh, you, I've already got my fingers poked several times in the back of these boards. Um, so this, this was the CPU card for Star. Uh, on the top, it's 16-bit wide, so there are four 4-bit four uh, 
uh, bit slices from AMD, the 2901s that Bob referred to. And then on the bottom was 4,000 entries of 48-bit wide micro instructions. And all of this ran at 137 nanosecond cycle time, uh, or seven megahertz. Um, all that, of course, and more fits on a single chip today, so it's kind of, a, kind of disheartening to see more. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's good stuff. Okay, this is a, a quarter megabyte of dynamic memory. A quarter megabyte. All right, a quarter. Eight, eight expensive. Eight times as much memory fits on one of these chips. If I cover up the other ones, so eight of these fits on one of these today. Uh, these are 16 kilobit DRAMs, and today they're 16 megabit DRAMs. So there's a factor of 1,000 and the number of bits per a chip stored there per chip store here. So uh, that's, that's the industry for you. Again, it's very humbling. Uh, I moved on to the memory. So I, oh, the other day, what I almost forgot about the memory is that Dave Liddell mentioned it supported virtual memory. So even though the memory itself was only a quarter megabyte, by the way, it was nice to hear, Dave, you finally let the gate open so that the poor software people could run with more memory, because I remember it was swapping too much. But, Later, with the 64 kilobit DRAMs, it could get up to a megabyte and a half of memory. Um, but it did support eight megabytes of virtual memory, which uh, seemed like a lot of time. And one of the amazing things about this board is it supported error correction codes. So if there was a single bit failure, it would be corrected. And that actually was a feature that didn't show up on, on the PC we bought later that year. Um, now, the Ethernet. So I, of course, the first Ethernet was done here at Park, the three megabit Ethernet. Uh, we worked on the follow-on version, the 10 megabit. This board, even though it looks big, is amazing. Uh, the top half of the board is the Ethernet controller itself and demonstrates how small the hardware was in the case of the Dandelion. You have to realize that each of these little black chips um, maybe has eight flip-flops in it, you know, and, and four NAND gates, and, and uh, so really small-scale integration. Uh, so the Ethernet controller was only 88 chips, whereas in the mini computers that I had showed you, it was more like hundreds of chips. In fact, I'll never forget the Vax 11, 7, 80 Ethernet board. It was as big as your washing machine, just for the Ethernet. And when DEC and, and Intel came and looked at our, and saw our Ethernet implementation, they just about collapsed uh, because they, maybe they thought we had an advantage. But uh, uh, <laughs> so anyways, one of the stories here on the Ethernet was I was designing the, it was called the Xerox wire at the time, and the target was 20 megabits a second, and I designed a board for a predecessor machine called the D0 or the Dolphin. And I had laid out the board and it didn't fit. So I went to Bob Metcalf and I said, you know, Bob, I can't get all the chips to fit at, at, at 20 megahertz. And I opened up, a, you know, everyone's got, you remember the old pictures of catalogs of parts? I opened up a parts catalog and there was a Fairchild 10 megahertz CRC or checksum chip. So I went, you know, a tail between my leg to Bob, and I said, Bob, if we run at 10 megahertz, this all fits. So that's why the Ethernet runs at 10 megabits a second. <laughs> okay. All right, now we get into some fun stuff. Uh, disk. This was the Shugart SA-1000. <laughs> which is the industry's first low-cost 8-inch disk. Uh, well, I'm not sure how much it weighs, but it's low-cost, it's $1,000. Um, they're actually pretty reliable. The designer of this disk might be in the audience. I don't know if Joel Harrison is here. I met him recently at Quantum, and he told me lots of secrets about the disk. He said, they still work? He thought that <laughs> apparently uh, they thought that the heads would have welded to the surfaces by now. And some customer, he said, they had, said they'd never buy them because it wouldn't last 20 years. Well, he's going to go tell that customer they're still working. Um, so we, we had one fun experience uh, with it, uh, sorry, uh, which was the, uh, the disk ran synchronously with the CPU, totally synchronously. And you had to supply the clock data to the disk. And so that was tied to the Dandelion's clock. So when this system was sent to Japan, where they had 50 hertz AC motors, uh, it didn't work. And uh, they learned they had to replace the pulley and the belt in Japan, and so there were two stock versions of those for 50 hertz and 60 hertz. Now, of course, today, 
Uh, this is eight megabytes. Uh, this is eight gigabytes. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, thousand x. So the software better be a thousand times better. <laughs> So now, you know, and to be honest with ourselves, this obviously wasn't enough for a, a network system to store all those images that Dave was saying needed to be printed. So the dandelion could also support uh, bigger disks, Trident and larger quantum disks, which had to be in a ha housing all by themselves. Okay. All right, the display uh, was um, 808 by 1,024 columns, 38 frames a second, and you can't change that. So actually, when Dave gives the demo, there's going to be a little bit of flickering you're going to see because we can't adjust the frame rate on these guys. Remember, they're tied to the CPU clock. Everything's running synchronously. Um, the innovative thing about the display is there are 32 extra lines on the top and bottom and sides, which are called the border pattern. And we could make that equal to the border pattern of the rest of the display. And I had a, heard an interesting explanation of this. Maybe Dave can collaborate this. Apparently, in some cultures, if you have a picture of someone with a black border, it implies they're dead. So, <laughs> so they didn't want to have the display with a black border. So one of the nice features about the display is, is that you can make the border be any color you'd like. No, no, dead, no dead pictures. Um, and again, I've said the dandelion was synchronous with the display. The CPU, CPU cycle equals seven pixel times on the display. Uh, the memory equal 21 pixel times and the disk equal uh, 6 pixel times. So it was a pretty unique machine. Had to do something about scaling it. Okay, <laughs> finally the, the IOP that Bob told you about. So this is where we uh, use this Intel chip. Um, actually, this is an AMD chip. <laughs> uh, kind of like an uninvited guest in some sense. I mean, it was definitely okay for running low speed I.O. Uh, but over time, it, I guess it became something of a Trojan horse. Um, it could handle this, this board. Uh, so as part of the, this, this board, the um, 8085 uh, ran the uh, eight-inch floppy uh, drive, which we all recognize, um, which has also gotten dramatically smaller <laughs> these days. Uh, the eight-inch, uh, I guess all computers have to have a floppy. No, they were networks. Uh, the, the other things we had on here were the keyboard controller and the LED maintenance panel, which is underneath there, which tells you what state your machine is in, and uh, connections to the laser printer COM ports and TTY ports. Uh, so actually, it was a fully, pretty capable machine. We just didn't tell all the customers they could take their star hardware and hook it up to a laser printer and all that kind of stuff, but the same hardware could do that. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> 800 kilobytes, as I would guess. The, I think the, the double density were 800 kilobytes. All right, so I, like Bob, that's it for my hardware show until my arms can't take any more. Although I guess I could show, this was the original Ethernet uh, transceiver. This was an evolution of the three megabit design. There's probably some up in the ceiling, I'm sure, still here. <laughs> in fact, I'm sure there's some dandelions probably running here at Xerox, and these machines are probably homing in on them right now. <laughs> 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 so, okay, now this, this machine wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for the revolutionary network design environment that had been created. I mean, I stepped out of school and walked into this environment. I thought I had walked into a science fiction novel. Uh, you know, I, at, at Stanford, I was using par punched cards, and, and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, here's, here are the altos with their bitmap screens and networking, and, you know, I thought I was on drugs. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't, and what this environment allowed us to do was uh, to take advantage of these tools, and we actually ran like a small startup. I, the one thing I don't remember are the stock options. Uh, uh, but it allowed us to work around the clock. You know, with email, you could say what you had done, and then when the person came in when you weren't there, could read and take over from where you left off, and we actually did. We worked around the clock, and so we actually ran this project my father asked, how can you work around the clock when you can't communicate with people? And I just sent him an email message. What? Uh, you know, what's that? So it, it allowed this kind of product. And so actually, we, from the start of the design to having hardware running just took us a year, which is kind of standard for a complete system. And then another year to announce and ship. And it was, the hardware, like Dave mentioned, was actually announced first as a file print communication server in November of 1980. 
and then on April 27th, 81, as the Xerox Star 8010 Professional Workstation. And uh, I found an old slide and took it down and got it scanned. This was our debug environment. Uh, it shows, this is our favorite uh, windmill situation where we had the six boards uh, in a single station where we could access all the boards simultaneously. This was stitch weld technology so we could turn the board around really quickly, like in a couple hours. Remember, no software simulation environment. The Alto ran this great user uh, debug program called Burdock, which allowed us to single step the machine and, and read breakpoints and whatnot. And, and uh, I think that person is Dan Davies. He couldn't make it here tonight. Um, but uh, we were really proud of that, that debug environment. There's actually a person I've learned at Apple is trying to recreate this environment, so I'll let you know when he gets it going. Uh, all right, so Moore's Law has been operating since uh, 1959. You know, the star was, uh, I know they sold it for much less than the list price. I just wrote the list price up there. I'm sure Dave could sell you some at a great deal. Uh, they, you know, they were uh, a little expensive. They weighed a little bit and they took all the power out of your one core, out of your one outlet in your office. Um, but, you know, they, again, they were a third the cost, third the weight, and a third the power of a machine which really had the comparable performance at the time. So they were actually very revolutionary for their time. Uh, but you know, now uh, memory chips are a thousand times denser and CPUs are a thousand times faster. And so I have wondered whether software is a thousand times better, but one thing I've noticed looking at these statistics over the years, having worked on risk machines since here, was the I.O. has only gone up 10x. And so even though the processor and memory has gone up a thousand x, the I.O., the disk drives and the ethernet are lagging. So you know, if you keep making the software which faults, and page faults, and uses the networks, you know, it's not going to run that much faster, really. And so actually, when you see the demo that Dave will be giving next, you'll see it's actually pretty, pretty quick, pretty capable. So finally, I wanted to say, uh, if a picture is a thousand words, I wanted to say a thousand thanks to Xerox. Uh, Xerox, uh, you know, they put the investment, they put the time, t time in, they allowed the team to be created. You know, walking into this kind of design environment was just a, a magical experience for everyone involved. And, uh, you know, Xerox really deserves a lot of recognition for doing that, uh, for allowing us to put into the marketplace a product, you know, to explore the Pioneer product, which was totally new, uh, the new concept for a PC and a new concept for a workstation. You know, basically the world's first uh, bitmapped, networked PC. And a, a thousand thanks go to Xerox uh, for allowing us to do that. So that's my presentation. So, so next, uh, Dave Smith's going to give us a demo.